Greetings, Zero and Repeater Books readers. Today we're joined by Vron Ware to talk about her latest book, Return of a Native, Learning from the Land. Vron is a highly accomplished sociologist, geographer, and gender theorist, and one of the key voices in the field of critical whiteness studies. Return of a Native is a deeply intimate work which tells the story of rural England through a local investigation of Ron's hometown in North Hampshire. In telling this story, the mythologization of the British countryside is challenged, exposing a hidden history of resistance to capitalism, racism, and patriarchy. Ron, thank you very much for agreeing to speak with us about your work. You're welcome, and thank you for inviting me. <laughs> um, we previously had uh, the translators of Sven Lindqvist's Dig Where You Stand onto the show, and uh, one of them, uh, Astrid von Rosen, brought up your book as an example of someone using the methodology of uh, which, which Lindqvist espouses in his work. Did you have any familiarity with Lindqvist's work when you started writing your book? And what drew you towards this as a subject? Yes, I, I knew Sven Lindqvist's work quite well, and I'd read and reread things like the uh, Saharan Journeys, and obviously um, Terra Nullius and Exter Exterminate All the Brutes. I mean, I found his work very generative and very kind of courage giving in, in terms of all, all my work, particularly the hit more historical material. So yeah, he was one of my he was one of my guides I sort of went back to. This this book, Return of a Native, actually has been on my on my mind for about let me think, since the late nineties. Since the late nineties. And I guess what happened was I randomly got a job, not random, I was working in a, a feminist planning organisation, not having known anything about planning before that, but stopped me from going back further as to why I got that job. Anyway, as a result of the feminist planning um, job I had for six years in London, I found myself teaching in a cultural geography setting at a time when cultural geography as a sort of sub-discipline um, was just being developed as a kind of breakaway uh kind of more political cultural studies version of, of, you know, traditional geography. So I found myself, the first course I was asked to teach was called Landscape and Society. And I literally had, I had no idea what, um, I mean, I was handed an old syllabus, but I had to sort of make up a path through this. And it was a year long course. It wasn't just like one semester. And this was in the University of Greenwich. And the, the, the campus was in Woolwich, actually, in Woolwich Arsenal. So it was deep in South London, part of South London I didn't know very well. And the students there um, didn't go up to London. And of course, I came from North London to teach there. So for me, it was just a journey through the centre of the city and out the other side. But they very rarely had a reason to go to cross the river. So there were all kinds of conditions and things that made me think more about place and culture and politics. So that was really got me going and, and, and thinking about landscape as well landscape as a, as a topic something to study to analyze there was obviously a, a rich uh, literature much of which was uh, north american um in origin but it was one of those things where you sort of learn on the job and of course there's raymond williams country in the city which i had to teach so i had to to read that so what stuck in my mind from that time and why I sort of go back to it is partly the idea that the, the, the students I was teaching then had little idea about rural England and little sort of, it was very hard for them to imagine what it might be like to have come from there, to live there. Where they lived was sort of deep suburban London. So it was neither the city nor was it the country and... I suppose it came to a head when we had a discussion one day when we were talking about the word modern, trying to think about modernity, modernism. What, what did the word modern mean to you? And they all basically said urban. And I guess that sort of planted a seed of thinking, well, does that mean that the rural is outside the modern, is outside history in a way, or it, it, it is only history, but it's not relevant to us in the 20th century this was still the 20th century so that's really a way of saying this book's been on my mind for a, a long time and um, it's had various iterations and I came back to it in 2018 and just wrote it quite quickly in this format 
um, having, I mean, I wasn't thinking about it all the time, you know, I'm not that slow at kind of getting things together. I'd sort of put it down and come back to it and things had happened and I had a different relationship to the place. And I was teaching a different group of students. I taught in the States and I was teaching in Kingston, the university actually. And again, there was a sense that the students in Kingston were not expected to think about rural England. It was kind of nothing to do with them and it was unfair to expect them to engage with ideas about what was rural. You know, the whole movement towards diversity was like, no, you teach them things they already have a, set, a sense of connection to. Um, you mustn't teach them about rural England. So again, that set me off thinking, um, I need to do something about this. Yeah, if I could ask on, just to kind of follow up, hopefully meet me from that. And I'd yeah, definitely like to go back to ask you about the composition of the book, given the time span you mentioned in a bit. But just um, prompted by Kenny's Lindquist comment is, one of the elements that Linquist kind of really well expresses in Digway's stand is how the places he's writing about are very, as sites and spaces become very saturated with history and struggle and experience and in particular violence. Um, and your account, I think in so many ways also is about the kind of saturation of a place with, with violence. Um, and that's one of the ways you, you know, I think possibly interrogate the idea of um, the rural as a kind of idyll. Um, so, you know, the discussion of, how there were millions of bushels of human and non-human remains from the Battle of Waterloo scattered as fertilizer across the land to some of the quite shocking cases of a local murder and disputes over supposed ascendant street crime. Um, so like a discussion of violence within the rural kind of uh, was one of the themes I was quite interested to ask you about and how that kind of came to take shape as a, as a quite prominent kind of um, vein throughout the book and the way in which you were interrogating the idea of the rural as a space kind of separate from either modernity or from urban life. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, uh, some of that I've, I discovered as I was writing. I mean, to go back to the idea of, of sort of method and, and how Sven Lindqvist writes, there's a sense of a sort of connection to places, a sort of discovering places and uh, as assembling facts or information about um where you work, for example, or or your or your hometown, which you take with you as you travel. So there's a constant sort of interrogation of what has happened in certain places, what has made them how they are. And I suppose I sort of I knew from my experience that in my village, and it wasn't even a town, it was a very small village. It was a parish, really, because our village was so small we didn't even have our own church. That you could stand there. And you could see the world kind of making taking shape around you. You could see the forces of agrarian capitalism. You could see the forces of industrialization, uh, globalization, um, continuing as well. And as we know, those processes involve enormous violence against um, particularly like working class people, minorities, um, and and it's possible to sort of unpick that. And it jumps up at you. You know, it's not you don't have to look very far to find those levels of violence. Although having said that, the, the question of the bone meal and fertilizer um, is a story that kind of unravels. The more you look, the more you find. That I came at um that the question of of the bone meal and the bones being gathered from the battlefields in, in Europe in the Napoleonic Wars. I found that through the um literature on the metabolic rift, you know, more of a sort of, um, you know, the monthly review books that John, um, okay, I'm not going to remember his name now, uh, Foster. John Bellamy Foster. Foster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> the, um, that literature, um, I think I came across it in monthly review press, but it connected up with the story about the local workhouse, uh, which was a, a, a national event in 1846 uh, when there was a, an inquiry into the cruelty of the um, treatment of the people, the people in the workhouse and the fact that their job was to make bone meal. So there was a very strong connection. And obviously the violence of that particular system, the poor law system at that time, you know, and the building's still there in, in Landover, you know, just near the high street, the building is still there. It still says, you know, 1836 on the front, even though it's been, been um, turned into all kinds of other other things by now it's a block of flats at the moment so the violence i think uh is definitely there and of course the the, the swing riots were very 
that the swing rioters were very militant around there. A lot of people were arrested, transported, executed. Again, this is a story of working class history and an agrarian working class history that's not that well known, actually. And it's not often seen as a sort of precursor to the industrial working class that formed in the sort of second half of the 20th century, 19th century. As a slight tangent then related to that, do you think there's uh, any particular reason why the history of the agrarian working class doesn't tend to be told as much as, say, the history of the industrial working class? I think it's more piecemeal, and I think it it depends on how you how you put it together. I mean, we have the idea of Luddites, and of course that word has passed into a kind of rather derogatory sense of people who can't deal with new forms of technology. But if you look at the riots uh, and rebellions that were happening in workplaces, um, you know, in in the end of the 18th century, early 19th century, and you start piecing it together, you get, you know, what Andreas Malm has said, you know, the shadow of resistance following every every technological development. It is there. I think I think it's it's partly because of the trade union movement didn't really emerge until sort of mid 19th century. Um, I mean, you see it in literature a bit more. You see it in the, you know, the threshing machines in Tessa the D'Urbervilles. But that struggle was sort of going on until, I guess, you know, into the early 20th century. Um, and of course, you know, in the, in, as I describe in the book, after the after the 1945, then the technology and the and, and the chemicals really started changing the way that farming was organized. So I, I did have uh, a more specific question, uh, uh, and it relates to maybe just some of my other experiences uh, seeing, say, sociologies of the countryside. When reading your book, I couldn't help but think of uh, Henri Lefebvre's Critique of Everyday Life, uh, uh, one of my you know, guilty pleasures, uh, an old French Marxist whose work I, I, I particularly appreciate. And where there's a chapter in it, uh, in the first volume, called Notes Written One Sunday in the French Countryside. Um, and there, Lefebvre is concerned with kind of the role that festivals and rituals play in the reproduction of everyday life. And there's quite a stark contrast in how you and Lefebvre treat uh, uh, agrarian life. Um, your book takes an almost opposite perspective looking at the disruption of traditions in the countryside with the encroachment of technology and various civilizational concerns. Um, but I think there's also something in your book uh, which would be you know, almost anathema to what Lefebvre is trying to do. And that's there's a sense of regret in your book uh, that something is being lost by the transformation of the countryside today, increasingly into a place of kind of production and commerce. So I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts on, you know, maybe on conservative narratives about the purity of pastoral life, which Lefebvre, you know, really vehemently opposes. And maybe whether what's being taken away in the midst of all this could somehow be transformed into a left-wing cause. Maybe that's a bit of a nebulous question, but I hope it makes well, sense. It yes, you, you, said a, you said a lot there. You sort of explained a lot of what's been going on. Obviously, in France, there's a, a peasant economy, which you know, s survives actually, or, or, or perhaps not now, but has survived much, much longer than it has in this country where it was it was kind of extinguished. I mean, I've been writing about Salisbury Pl Plain recently, and I have a book that was written in like 1913, and there's already a kind of mournful description of what the harvest used to be like and what the women used to wear and how they used to behave. And again, Hardy was very interested in those um, rituals and ceremonies and and um, celebrations in in rural areas, which he could already see, were being threatened. So by the sort of migration of people from rural areas into the towns, and obviously in towns they took different forms, but then people were doing different kinds of work, and um, and that changed them as well. But I think some of them survived into the industrial in in, in the industrial centres. But I think this idea. That there's been this huge loss that everything has changed and everything has been um, sort of destroyed or lost this regret this nostalgia is absolutely part of how the English countryside is constituted mm -hmm. I mean that is part of the problem because in a sense it's like that's the real England therefore England is constantly injured England England is something that has lost has lost its kind of meaning has lost its way and this is because of you know forces of you know, you name them, immigration, modernization, um, urbanization, 
that has sort of damaged this sense of what England actually once was. And you see it in, in many books written about England. I mean, you, you must know um, Aikenfield, Ronald Blythe's book. And, he, you know, in, he, he did this, um, I mean, he was a sociologist. He was asked to write a book about a village or the, the village. And a village is a very interesting concept if you think of it in a kind of global uh, setting. It means different things in different places, but we all know what we mean by village. And he didn't really, so he was part of this kind of international edited collection of, of work around the idea of the village. He didn't really know how to approach it. So he, basically what he says is he just went to this village in Suffolk and he just started talking to somebody about their memories of life there and they started talking. And then he says the book just appeared. You know, he just wrote interviews with several people and he created this incredible portrait of a place that was already undergoing change. And in my experience of talking to people, because the good thing about beginning such a long time ago is that I interviewed people who were then at the end of their lives in 1998, 99, when I did the first round of interviews, you know, who who didn't, you know, who'd already been dead some time when I, when I wrote this, the, the, this actual book in 2018, 2019. So I could draw on their memories. But everybody's always remembering how things were in the, in the past. And it doesn't necessarily mean dancing around in clogs it can mean all kinds of things it can mean when the the pub was functional or there was a, a many more people of different class backgrounds in a small place all negotiating questions of class difference and i think that's kind of gone really that's been flattened out so i think that, that there are many ways that you could identify this sense of loss you know it's not just about memory it's actually sort of it's part of the representation of the english countryside is this sort of sense that it it is somehow outside history. This is the bits that are left that haven't been spoiled, but they kind of are spoiled and they're enclosed and you can't walk on them anymore. And And this is this kind of incredible thing that used to exist, but is not really available to us anymore. I think that's really something to challenge and something to unpick and something to, to try and... Um, make accessible to people in a different way. And I'm not talking about, you know, necessarily right to roam or or nature walks or the idea of being outside and having fresh air. I mean, really thinking about the development of this country and the violence, Dante, that you mentioned and what's happened to make it like that, kind of severed from some experience of contemporary life and culture. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting you mentioned because I was a few months ago at the start of the year, actually, I was reading uh, Alan Halkin's book, The Death of Rural England, um, which I think is kind of unfortunate name because it's such a severe title about, well, okay, that means rural England has died, but obviously yes, it's a much more complex yeah, story than actually what's even being narrated yeah. in that book about, you know, the co very complex processes, demographic, political struggles, which kind of have led that, which, you know, and which your book reflects on so well. And then just to follow up briefly before I ask another question, so you know, we have the swing riots, but we also have the tall puddle martyrs. And it's always nice to think, you know, the tall puddle martyrs festival does carry on. If we're talking of festivals and celebrations, then the tall puddle martyrs festival, you know, some is a surviving tradition and celebration, which really, you know, that's not like a historical anachronism. It's a living, continuing politi site of political practice and engagement and celebration, which has to do with the politics of the countryside and the tradition after the tall puddle martyrs. So, you know, it's interesting these things do carry on and there's, yeah there's so much to we shouldn't shouldn't be ignored um yeah just i wanted to ask a slightly different question following on it really about the composition of the book which i know you mentioned earlier which i was rereading um an interview you gave for soundings journal a few years ago which you, you know you mentioned initially writing the book also in the context of the iraq war and the anti-war movement um so i was in some sense asking you know if you you mentioned it there if you felt there was an impact on there at all and i know you've worked on on uh, war related subjects as well and then a broader question about the form of the book um because i think i was quite lucky to have read it quite quickly after i read hazel carby's imperial intimacies who i know you've um i think spoken to about return of a native as well and that there's some kind of relationship and it really feels like a companion volume in my mind not said it actually is of life writing projects which really interrogate the relationship between local and global and long-term structural processes but really when you read the book it also has a very different feel that's it's closer to lots of other kind of life writing and nature writing projects and then also kind of literary fiction pieces which are very ambulatory like uh Sebold's the rings of saturn where you know it's about a movement between places you look along the crossroads so it's just really interesting to try and get a sense of the 
I mean, it's always a, a kind of constricting question about the question of genre or form of the book, but it's really important, I think, about how the actual content comes together in Return of Native is also to look at the, the form it all comes together. So, yeah, this, those two hopefully related questions on the composition of the form of the book. Yes, I, I think um, it's interesting you mentioned Hazel Carby because, um, yeah, we do go back a long way. And actually we had a, there's a sort of memorable time when I was living in the States um, teaching at the same university as as Hazel. And we had a seminar called First Person Singular. And there was um, myself, Hazel, there was a number of like amazing women who were all working in some way around life writing, including my friend Sarah Nuttall from Johannesburg, who was writing about what she called the autobiographical act in South Africa. One of the things that happened after 94 was that everybody began writing memoirs. Everybody, you know, where my, my, my truth, you know, my experience, my, this is who I am in the new South Africa. But also I have to say that, you know, feminist life writing has been around for a long time and was very formative to someone in my generation. So for example, Adrian Rich, June Jordan, um, Bell Hooks, you know, these were the things I was reading when I first started writing my first book, Beyond the Pale. And there's a way in which, as a feminist, you were both expected to um, and obliged to actually write where you're coming from and how, how you know about the things that you're writing about. And I guess I'd, I'd done that in my first book anyway, sort of like here, you know, here's where I'm coming from. I felt I had to um, because you weren't really allowed to write about race without doing that. But at the same time, nobody had quite interrogated that sense of what it meant to be racialized as as white. So I was kind of used to that way of writing and very inspired by a lot of people I'd I'd read. So a question of war, I mean, so I was living in the States during uh, the period of 9-11 and the build up to um, the invasion of Iraq and came back here in 2005. So it, it crept in to my sense of discussing things in in you know in early versions of trying to write about a village in England which felt more and more kind of peripheral and unimportant and I think that was one of the one of the reasons why it didn't quite work even though I finished it it didn't quite work and then I kind of turned to writing much more forcefully about war and military and things like that but it it is actually the case that where I grew up is very near the um training base in Salisbury Plain so we could you know I mean I moan about the Chinooks going overhead but actually it was probably worse than that because we would I remember hearing the, the noise at night and saying what's that noise you know and it was it was guns going off and things and that's something I've written about subsequently and and hope, hope to sort of do more of um I think your question was very um interesting and sort of quite a lot of parts to it I'm not sure in terms of in terms of genre I think following those voices one another influential person was Lillian Smith who was writing a sort of mid 20th century she actually had a great uh, formulation of of sort of writing herself into the place and also writing out of the writing herself out of the place and I think that interested me as well a, a genre of feminist writing out of the kind of constructions, the way we, we're, we're um, positioned in society, you can write yourself out of that, particularly if you've been formed in a, a society that practices segregation, for example. I didn't really sit down and think, okay, this is how I'm going to write it. It kind of happened. Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it seemed that I, I can imagine it flowed like that quite well. And, you know, the opening, the, the premise of, you know, just looking out across through the roads and stuff and tracing it all through there seems like obviously an organic one in quite a literal sense yeah yes I mean I, ha I had an organization of all the different themes and different interviews and then of course a lot of things had happened since and I I'd found out a lot of things and I also felt it was it was too rambly you know as a as a sort of mode of writing it didn't necessarily take the reader um like there was a whole thing on the architecture of the village and how all the different housing styles which I thought was really interesting you know the Swedish flat pack and then there's like old thatch cottage and then there's like modern bungalow and you know like it was actually quite interesting to just walk down the street and see all the different but um an earlier version an earlier editor said why would anybody want to know that I mean I think also there wasn't really a climate of writing about these small places it was very sort of ungenerous you know if you're not well known you can't 
you can't get away with it. But I don't, in t your reference to nature writing, I, I don't, I sort of steer clear of that, um, I have to say, and that sense of um, that as a, as a genre and where that, I mean, obviously there's some beautiful writing, um, there's some incredible writing about, about sort of attentiveness to place in relation to the living world around you, but that's not where I fe felt my strengths were. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the great tits a few times and a few, you know, pigeons and things. And that is really important as a sort of holistic way of understanding place, you know, the sounds and the sights and the smells and everything. But I guess I was really trying to get at the kind of the, the worlding, you know, where this place belonged in the world and how actually you can do it anywhere. You know, you could. And, and actually the first version, I was I was was more of a history of the village. People said, oh, your village sounds so interesting. It's like so many things have happened there that are you wouldn't expect. Well, yes. Uh, but it was too, I don't know, it was too kind of bit, kind of hokey to write about a village and it had been done before. And so I thought if I stood in the field and thought about the places around and then I, I don't know why I returned to Hardy at that point because I'd had a sort of phase of reading him, you know, quite some time before. And then the idea of sort of going back somewhere, the return of a native, the return of the native, I had a look at it and it was just something about the way it was a heath and the heath just absolutely clicked. You know, I could sort of use this idea of the heath. And then, of course, I began finding out things about this patch of ground that I didn't I know. But it's like a hunch, you know, it's a mysterious place. So let's find out more about it. And so that pro proved to be very productive to stand somewhere that really wasn't anywhere. It was a good place to think from, um, which is the, you know, which is the field on the front of behind me. There's a really interesting dialectic then that I think you've just brought up that I'd like to pick up on maybe. Um, uh, just at the beginning of your response to Dante, uh, you mentioned that there's kind of a relation between your book and uh, positionality or confessions of positionality within, uh, say, critical theory or within race studies or gender studies and so on. Um, and of course, that's an incredibly important practice to be able to say, you know, this is my background, this is what might uh, uh, limit the perspective that I'm able to bring to this, and this is also where maybe in a more positive sense my perspective comes from. But as an exploration of positionality, it's, it's really interesting that this is a book of trying to state in the most thorough of terms, this is where I come from, this is my positionality, but also to say, uh, just as you did towards the end there, that this positionality is also in some sense a non-place, to use Mark Auge's term. Yes, I mean, I think... I think what I felt was, and actually the, the Tarek Goddard, the editor of Repeater, had this, I mean, he's had this fantastic response to reading the first draft. And he just said, it's fine, don't change a line. But I think we want to know what's in it for you. What's your stake in it? You know, we turn up at this place, you start taking it to part, but what, why? And so it took me another two or three weeks to kind of, oh, do I have a preface? Do I have this? Do I have that? And then I just... I just wrote in the bits about having an ex knowing somewhere well and seeing it change over such a long period of time was an opportunity. And in fact, there's a sense of responsibility in a way I could I could take I could grasp that opportunity and really try and use it to 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 write this book. And I think I can't remember exactly when. I think after I'd finished, I read the introduction to Deepesh Chakrabarti's um, his latest book, which I know I'm going to not remember the title, and um, the one about climate, how uh, writing history. But in the introduction, there's this wonderful quote where he says, "Writing historically is," and he kind of goes through the layers of what it might mean to now, knowing what we know about um, the 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 planet and the and the question of climate crisis and um, what our future looks like, how we might write history, and there's a sense of of deep engagement with like geological time, um, and then through all the processes that we've spoken of, you know, the the that particularly um, industrialization and and those kind of processes, and he goes through all that, and then he ends up with a sense of 
how important it is also to include the phen phenomenological sense of what it felt like at any time, what it feels like to be uh, alive at that time or in that place. And it kind of knitted it all together. And I thought, well, actually, actually that's what I've done, because a lot about this is like the archaeological stuff, which I find really more and more interesting, you know, and then the historical, the personal, the social, the cultural, the gender, the race, the, all those things are in there. And there's also the Sheila and the Frank who can say, and myself as well, I don't know what it was like. I remember this. I used to do this. I had a job here. I taught here. Those things all kind of a part of it. So I felt kind of vindicated. So I think I lifted one of his um, phrases about how this sense of knowing the place for a long time offered the opportunity to know about important things like life and death you know, to see things um, born and die in the place over a period of time. And, and I suppose that something else you're able to bring to this uh, is also almost seeing the formation of a non-place. You know, there's this, uh, I think it's the second last chapter of the book. Um, you talk about uh, these commuter towns or, or spaces of, or spaces through which one would simply pass on their daily commute. And that strange episode with Nigel Farage. <laughs> um, but do you feel any kind of sense of connection with uh, this transition in a sense from these places in the countryside being spaces where uh, communities of humans have existed for a long, long time, only for them to uh, suddenly, with the expansion of uh, the cities surrounding them, with the expansion of maybe the larger towns surrounding them, to suddenly become a non-place, something that one merely passes through. A change from being a lived place to a liminal place. Mm, interesting. Well, I think that, that those places are always meaningful to some people, particularly the people who live there. Um, I mean, I think it's it's incredible that, you know, all the discussions about new build, you know, when you drive down say the 303 or the m5 or somewhere going down to the southwest you see a lot of um new building on the edge of places well you know all suburbs was once new building on the edge of places um you know half of london was once new build on the edge of the city and it gets quickly absorbed and turned into to um a place of its own you know with its own identity and that's happening all the time i mean i think that given the sort of what's happening with housing in this country and the fact that people are being pushed out of London, I mean, we've read that recently, but also other larger cities, a combination of rent, renting becoming prohibitive and certainly buying property becoming impossible for younger people, then actually there is a sense, to, I think to some extent, people are moving back to where they are from. And I think some of the smaller towns are... I mean, maybe this is anecdotal, are becoming more interesting to a younger generation. My generation, um, a lot of, I think it was kind of common to leave home at the age of 18. If you went to university, you didn't like necessarily come back and live at home. You, you moved on and you got drawn into the big cities and places that were much more exciting. But I think that has changed. So I think, I mean, I was at an event at the um, Devon Transformed. I spent a lot of time in the Southwest the other day and it was supposed to be about sort of place-based organizing and um everything went terribly wrong because i got accused of being a middle class intellectual because i'd said i didn't want to live in my village anymore in the opening statements i said i, I didn't i couldn't I never wanted to live there i mean why would you want to live in a small village in the middle of north hampshire and yeah so i got sort of dismissed but anyway it ended up everybody talking about where they were from and a bit like what you were saying dante earlier that actually hmm actually where I was from is here and maybe I should go back there more often, you know, a sense of, a, of connection with places that don't seem to be very interesting, but also possibility of making something new, you know, making culture, making resistance, making community in smaller places. Given that you can't afford to live in, in the kind of more exciting cities, maybe that's something that can happen. So I think these things could change. I mean, you asked earlier about a, a sort of left view of, of rural England. And I mean, it, it, the possibilities are there, you know, the, the, the possibilities of working from home, of communication, of setting things up, of, of culture and, and mobility. Things look very different now than they did 
you know, 50 years ago when the kinds of work that were on offer were, you know, related to new forms of industry on the industrial estates or teaching or social work. You know, there was sort of a limited number of jobs, but they were relating to to a kind of urban centre of some kind, whether it was large or small. So, I mean, when you use, say, Mark Auger's sense of non-place, I think of that more of a sort of sprawling North American city rather than a kind of sprawling small town you ha- i mean so andover which of course is the is the town andover was massively expanded in the second half of the um 20th century you know it was a, it was a new town so it was massively expanded and you can sort of see from the age of the housing estates um how it's been added onto and it's it's still being added onto um, so if you arrive by train, the line where this town starts is always further back into the fields. It was quite extraordinary. And you, they're still building, you know, bulldozers and things. As So, you know, if you come a month later, there's more houses that have finished. I wouldn't say they were non-places. I would say they had a, a, a strong connection to that town in some sense. Yeah. But they can also be a community in and of themselves of that particular estate. Yeah, I think we we should have a full-blooded defense of what you might have described as non-place because as much as yeah maybe you don't we might you know certain people might want to live there you know you're talking about that in the book you talk there's a long chapter in discussion of how the trogs come from is it from Andover and from the area and you know all these places the, the suburbs and this kind of places between the urban and the rural they've always been extremely culturally productive often in the sense of people reacting violently against what they've been imagined to be the boringness and the kind of like dieness of their town but these places have always been quite culturally productive you know the amount of good music and culture that comes out of the suburbs as a response to these environments is one thing but also yeah you know in 50 years time all the people who've been forced out of london because their rents would be too are too high will have formed all of these relationships and cultures to these places that you've been discussing in the book discusses it's a continual process of reformation of these kind of cultural roots um but yeah, I, was, I just wanted to follow up on one of the things you also mentioned um, about really researching and discussing a place. And, you know, you talk very, very concretely, you know, I had the discussion with this person who remembers this. I had a discussion with this person who remembers this. And so much of the book is not just talking about local place, but it's also using local place and knowledge and history, parish magazines and rumours and gossip and half remembered stories, which I think is one of the joys of reading the book is working out how, how all that's pieced together. But in some sense, it's really productive, you know, these people who can give you a much richer history, which has never really been documented or studied, you know, academically or never really valued in that way. But also sometimes not particularly productive, like to go back to the Trogs when you interviewed the band member from the Trogs, said the interview wasn't wasn't all that interesting. And there was actually, you know, you learned much more interesting things by reading about a book about it. And sometimes people can offer the best insights into their own places. But also perhaps, you know, we develop blind spots about where we live because we live there. And, you know, perhaps it also takes someone to, to leave and to come back to then start that process. That's something you can only do when you leave a place is to then come back to it and make sense of it, which I, is a strong sense I got from the book. You know, you learn a lot and a lot of the book is expressed through local histories, whether they're oral or written. But also some of those things aren't particularly useful and people have their blind spot because they're, that's where they're situated. Yeah, if that makes sense as a question, as a prompt of how you use the local. Yes, well, I, I was... I. Spent lots of time thinking about the word parochial, and the idea of paro- the the idea of the parish and the parochial as things we tend to say in a disparaging way. It's parochial. It's too it's too uh, narrow. Um, like Rob Nixon in his his um, discussion of 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 the narrowness of a lot of American nature writing. Um, he talks about the. Um, uh, the bio parochial, you know, the sort of focus on one place being actually um, not particularly helpful or, or, or radical. That actually, that's that's quite problematic. I think for me that the, the starting with the parish was fascinating because of the idea of the border. So to me, it was like this is where borders were basically invented. You know that 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 the border between one parish and another at at time in, at times in the in the nineteenth century determined whether you got poor law relief, whether you got, you know, food and, and work at the end of the day. And I read something that said that 
you had to live somewhere for a year in order to be eligible to get poor law relief, as in, you know, work and and um, and food. And this goes back to the sort of Elizabethan times. So farmers might hire somebody for 364 days and then they'd have to leave. And then it was like, well, sorry, mate, you didn't make it. You're not, you're not eligible for, you know, so many grains of bushels of grain, whatever it is. And I just thought that is just ridiculous. And that and the the border obviously being marked, the parish boundary being marked ceremoniously, um, you know, every year in a kind of ritualistic way, which was, still happens. I mean, it's happened in the arches. It's I think it happened in I think the the farmer who I spoke to, you know, who I'd sort of grown up with, he um he'd had a go doing that for a bit. Not not many people were interested, in fact. Um, so the idea of the parish is interesting and the parish magazine, again, I'd sort of collected loads of them over the years. And the more you have, the more interesting it becomes because you get these little tidbits and ways of, you know, ways that people think about where they live and how they make community and how that changes over time. Um, I have to say the parish magazine was really not interested in my book at all. I was not inv- invited to talk about it or, or there was no review and to make it worse, they keep writing to me as if, do you have any news for this month's, you know, parish magazine? It's like, please take me off this list. <laughs> Just rubbing salt into the wound. But, you know, there's, I didn't really have anything in common with the people who live there now or feel particularly warm towards them, I have to say. Same with local media. I think that that is something uh, a bit like Patrick Wright. I think we sort of got addicted to looking at the, in his book, um, The Sea... Um, Let's talk about Yui Johnson and um, yes, that the local media uh, is is a fascinating thing in its own right. And I feel like even during the time I was looking at it constantly, and of course I've been looking at it again because of thinking about Salisbury Plain and Wiltshire, and it's the same sort of network of of papers um, or what we used to call papers. That's a huge loss, you know, losing local media, having journalists who really are invested in telling stories about their local place. They're all syndicated. So that was another kind of political issue, really, about information about about these places and how those places are served by um, a, a media that's interested in them and reports on things like, um, you know, the debates in the local council about what is going to happen to, for example, the town centre or, in that case, the... Um, uh, the proposed Centre for Asylum Seekers. You know, it's really important to have a, some kind of um, media that's discussing these things from different points of view and 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 telling people what's going on. But it's really shrunk. I mean, it's pretty dismal. So, so that's you know another thing in and of itself. So, what was the second part of your question about um, about those kind of sources? Yeah, I just I guess it's one of the bits I enjoyed is how that structured the book so much of just referring you know lots to discussions with people you know it was it's oral history in a sense of you know the book yes I mean you very kindly said I was a sociologist I think I think that the tools of sociology you know they can be quite useful but I'm 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 not really into the sort of interviews with people and then go and write up the interviews with sort of excerpts from things people have said. I've never really liked that. I found that difficult when I did a book about the the migrant soldiers that, um, you know, you need to let people speak and give them some, give some context about the people or the discussion you're having rather than just have chunks where, where this is what somebody said and then you sort of interpret it. But I found that the interviews that I'd done had really sat with me for quite a long time and you know if somebody had somebody had worked as a um in a particular house or or as a as a domestic worker or um like frank who knew how to cut hedges you know those things had stayed with me and i'd sort of carried them around with me in my head for like 20 years so it was it was a joy to be able to 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 use them and and a conversation with 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 roly the guy who told me about the um the the heath having been a, a commons and what happened to it after the war and that that story you know it was something he deeply cared about and when i went round to see him you know the idea that he sort of rooted through all his papers and got me stuff out from from decades ago and then sang me the song that he'd written about you know it was it was really such a privilege and 
and, and and I had a sort of real connection with him. So he really enjoyed the book and sort of gave it to his friends. Whereas, as I said, the people in the parish who I didn't know weren't particularly interested in a book about the parish, about the village. It wasn't the right kind of book. And they, they apparently they have literary evenings in a converted barn in the next village. And they said, mm, we'd really struggle to sell tickets for you. You know, they have like William Dalrymple and like really kind of, you know, well-known authors. Sorry, you didn't make it. But um, you know, I wasn't bothered about that. I'm not, don't think I'm on a sort of <laughs> vengeful thing about it because I didn't, wasn't really writing for them. I mean, another example is Kathleen Innes. So Kathleen Innes, you know, it's a little hardback, life in a Hampshire village. I'd bought it. And then years later, a friend of mine who's in um, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom said, have you come across this person, this book? I had no idea. There was nothing in the book to say that she was the secretary of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, you know, in the 1930s. There was nothing to say that. But putting it together and finding out more about her and finding someone someone in Canada had written a thesis about her that I was able to get hold of and find out more about her life and why she went back to this particular village and and what that meant in terms of, you know, the whole thing around how the Women's Institute what they did in the war because they weren't allowed to do any war work because they they included Quakers and they'd signed a, you know, they had a sort of non-denominational kind of pledge so they couldn't do war work because that was against the interests of the Quaker members. But they could house refugees, you know, they could grow food. There's lots of things they could do. And, and also, um, you know, leading members of the WI, which is, again, a really interesting phenomenon when you're thinking about rural England. Um, the, the leading members of the WI had been involved in planning and the sort of uh, during the war to think about rural planning after the war. That all came out of a random thing with a friend saying, do you know this person? I already had the book. And yes, I did know, but I might not have known. And actually, I must confess something here on record, which I got wrong, and that was partly my own failure to do enough Googling, which is that I cite someone called uh, Moutre Reed, who was one of the kind of motoring writers in the early 20th century who wrote about driving around um, the highways and byways of Hampshire. And I assumed it was a man. Well, in fact, it was a woman. And obviously, that makes it much more interesting. Yeah, and there's more, yeah. to say, more to say about her, but um, they're too late. Well, the second edition of the book will have to include that correction and the chapter on the uh, village architecture as an appendix as well and <laughs> insist that it gets put back in. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's interesting what you're saying about music, Dante, because uh, the last one of the last classes, the last um, batch of students that I taught um, in ending in 2021, um, there was a, most of the students were from different parts of London and it was all online, of course. I didn't meet any of them. Most of them I didn't even see because they didn't have their cameras on. And one of them came from Dorchester, as it turned out. And a friend of mine had sent me some um, some suggestions of um, musicians, actually rappers, who, who are not from London, who are from rural areas. And I don't know if you've come across Isaiah Dredd. Isaiah Dredd, magical, absolutely magical. He's standing in a rocking, sorry, he's standing in a field you know, and then he's in the kitchen with his mum cooking and everything. And and the, the, the student from Dorchester said he was at my school. He was like a local hero. He's at my school. He's young, you know, but he was in the year above her or something. And it was just a wonderful thing of like, there are these connections and there are these ways of of seeing what is entirely contemporaneous and modern and, you know, um, current that come from places like this, that the rest of the class wouldn't have known where Dorchester was. They wouldn't know where Dorset was. I mean, people in London don't really know Dorset, Devon. They get muddled up, you know, Somerset sort of, and then Cornwall's at the end, for example. I mean, I'm not very good on the Lincolnshire bits up there, but really that that was also sort of taught me a lesson that you can, you know, it's not that we think these places are actually a bit sort of out of time. They're not at all. But being able to see them and expecting them to be like that is something else. Well, I, I should thank you for 
uh, bringing up your your friend Roly uh, because that leads really on, well on to the next question that I was hoping to ask you. I think we're uh, just we're we're quickly running out of time, so I think unfortunately this will have to be the last question. Uh, you know, I was surprised to see in your book that there are these ongoing disputes in the UK about control of the commons. You know, when I think of uh, these struggles over the commons today, I think about reports that are done by like the Midnight Notes Collective, George Kavensis and Peter Limebaugh, and they seem to focus, you know, a lot more on ongoing struggles in Africa over people who still live off of the land uh, while that land is being subject to uh, direct processes of appropriation even today. But it seems like there's a real sense of injustice uh, among some people living in the British countryside over this seizure of land during World War II, which was never restored to the local community. And I'd be really interested in hearing more about kind of the history and nature of this fight for the commons within rural England, at least as it still exists today. I know talking about the struggle over the commons is a massive topic that could get us right onto the origins of capitalism. Uh, but could you possibly talk more about that and, and how it exists today? And also, you know, whether this has uh, any connection to so-called commoning movements around the world? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it does. I mean, this specific in, in, um, instance, um, so, the, so the land, like a lot of pasture or downland, was ploughed in 1941 onwards to grow food. So at the time, I guess it was controversial, but everybody understood it was a wartime measure. Um, and then the not being given back is a kind of fait accompli. Well, it's already, you know, people needed food in the 50s as well. So the farmer who was, who'd taken over that particular area of land kept it, you know, so and then people kind of forget. And then when he died, then there's a crisis. But actually what happened was in... Um, in 1965, there was a, I think it was one of the first laws passed to register common land, to any any bits of land that people knew were or had a claim to being common land had to be registered by a certain time. But of course, not everybody knew to do that, because how do you how do you tell people that's what they have to do if they know that? So the way that Rowley told it was that um, this was under Harold Wilson's time. Um, you had to get to Winchester, which is quite some way away, in order to register the land that you thought was um, commons. But the, the the deadline came quite quickly, so a lot of people didn't make it. But then he had a map, and he could show me to areas that I would you could drive past on your way to this Pill Heath, which um, was never returned to the to, to the commons um, because the Tory MP decided it was better to be sold, and the and the money was more um, important. Um, that there are patches of where well, you could take your cow and let it graze there. I mean, you you wouldn't believe it if you saw those land because you wouldn't. There's nothing special about them, but you would have to look at the map and say, "Hang on a minute, you can't claim that. That's something that, you know, I live near here. I can sort of avail myself of the resources that are there in that patch." But they are little, literally little scraps of land here and there, and I guess this was probably true in other parts of the country as well. But I don't think, I don't think it ever kind of turned into a kind of collective voice to return our commons um, back to us through that particular route and that particular history. I think, I mean, Rowley, Rowley, you know, there was a kind of campaign and he was on you and yours and, you know, back in the day and he felt very strongly about it, but nothing came of it. So I think it was a kind of very residual struggle for land that people could remember in living memory had been common, had been had been shared. But with the changes in farming and everything, nobody could quite see the point because they didn't have cows anymore that they want to take up there and graze. So it didn't really have a value. But I think now that the the right to roam campaigns, they're they're the ones who are pushing the sense of who has a right to what land and who what does ownership mean um, in terms of being able to, you know, ban live camp wild camping for example you know ancient rights that people had and i think that's probably where the most interesting and um forms of resistance are to kind of claiming back a sense of um of land that doesn't isn't enclosed just as private property where no one can go because there are obviously areas where you are allowed to walk i mean salisbury plain is another one where there are lots of rights of way and byways 
on Salisbury Plain. Um, I wouldn't say they were they were commons as such, because there are restrictions, but there are areas in the country where, you know, people are fighting to kind of hold on to what's not already been lost. But I did, you mentioned Peter Limebound, obviously I got a lot from reading his work. And I was going to say, actually, when you were talking about Lefebvre and, and standing in the French countryside, there's a wonderful essay by um, William Morris in Peter Limebough's book, Stop. In fact, it's, um, is it in Stop Thief? It's where he's talking about um, E.P. Thompson's work. And he's curious that Thompson on Morris, in fact, it's maybe it's, a, it's an essay on, on Thompson and, and Morris. He says Thompson doesn't really rate or discuss this particular essay, which is called Under the Shade of an Elm Tree. And I mean, think about method. William Morris is actually lying down under the shade of an elm tree. And he starts to think about England and war and um, the rural working class and, and all these bigger issues just from lying there from what he can hear and what he can imagine is happening in the field next to him. It's a wonderful bit of writing. It's a fairly short essay. And again, I found that after I had finished and I felt very sort of heartened by that. You know, that this was, a, this was a tradition that you can, even if there's nobody working in the field, you know, you can draw on what happened in those fields and why there nobody, why is there nobody there? Why is there nobody working there? What, what happened to sort of extinguish the labour that you can see, you know, produced the way it looks now? You know, just because you can't see it doesn't mean to say it isn't there. You don't have to go anywhere. You could just literally stand at a crossroads and, and start to see all this, these processes, these forces, you know, violence and everything. I, I guess that's a part of what's so interesting about the dig methodology, the dig where you stand. That you, can, you can just be somewhere and you can find out the history of the world by investigating your local surroundings. Um, regrettably, I think we're going to have to more or less end the conversation here. This has been very interesting and I, I have a lot more questions, but maybe those will have to wait for another time. Um, but in, in closing, I was wondering, Ron, uh, whether there is anything you'd like to share with our listeners, if you have any other projects on the go at the moment, or if you have uh, anything coming up that you'd like to share with them. Well, um, hmm. thank you. Thank you, Kenny. I mean, I've mentioned Salisbury Plain couple of times and I've been struggling with a project which is more a legacy sociology project to be honest and it's a, it's a group project um, which I had the pleasure of, of rewriting to so that to smooth it out and this is something that I've been wanting to do for a long time because uh, and, and actually Dante you mentioned about about war and how the Iraq war might have seeped into the first version of this book and it's really about that it's about how this countries kind of constituted through violent um, violence and an increasingly militaristic uh, sort of grip in terms of how we understand what this country is and what it has been. So where things I've discovered also about, um, about this area uh, that, that I've been writing about in Return of a Native that relate to what happened in the Second World War, which I, I won't go into now, but endlessly complicating and um, in some ways enriching an understanding of of how we have come to have these very kind of, um, you know, artificial boundaries between urban and rural and what we see and what we don't see. So all I would say is thank you for the opportunity. Yes, the book about Salisbury Plain is called Khaki Country and it's not the same style as, it's not volume two at all. It's very different, but possibly one day in the future there might be more of a volume one and a half which thinks tries to think about these things again from underground up um in fact this one might start from the sky with the um hot air balloons for a change um <laughs> ramble ramble <laughs> no, 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 no. it's all super interesting stuff and i, I look forward to getting my hands on a copy of Khaki Country. But uh, for just one last time for anyone watching, uh, this is the book. You can get it from the Repeater Bookstore or probably even your local bookstore. Uh, it's a fantastic book. I very strongly recommend picking it up. And one last time, Ron and Dante, thank you both very much for taking thank some you. time out of your busy schedules yeah. to speak with us about Thank this. you. Cheers. Thank you so much. It's really, really nice to talk to you. And really, thank you very much for your questions. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. 
Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.